we have this sort of Joe of Ratner syndrome within the party. You know, he, he expressed surprise that his customers stopped buying his products when he labelled them as crap. Well, our voters similarly will be uh, disinclined to support us if, if we all the time say that our own policy, what we're seeking to achieve, is complete rubbish. And we've had far too much from internally uh, colleagues talking down, finding problems with this, that and the other. Um, and ultimately, uh, it's the same kind of uh, reaction out there, which if we, are, we don't believe in ourselves and what it is we're trying to do, I'm afraid others won't. And so it's for us to project what it is we're about, what it is we wish to continue to achieve for the country. Uh, and that is the only way to avoid a so-called existential crisis. This is the Exit Interviews. Today, William Peter Rag joins me for his Exit Interview, a chance for us both to learn what you could have done better. Uh, so, uh, William Rag, you've been an MP for Hazel Grove since 2015. That's right. Why are you leaving us? I suppose because I, I want to do something different. Um, I'm not necessarily going to you know, talk in terms of tiny violins screeching away as to why I think being an MP is an absolutely awful um, job because I don't. Um, I just came to the conclusion after a time that I wanted a, a change and I've always had the view in life that if you do something for a while, obviously enjoy it for the vast majority of the time, but then decide you want to do something else uh, rather than whinging and moaning about the situation you find yourself in, you should make that change and that's what I've done. You're only 36. I don't look it, I know. But no, but, but it was more that you'd been, uh, that wasn't what I was saying, it was more that you've been an MP for, for almost a decade. Yeah. It's very young to be a former MP. Yeah, I think my misspent youth was getting there, clearly, um, at the age of 27. Um, parliamentary candidate at 25, uh, elected to by local council at 23. Uh, candidates list uh, that same year. So, yeah, most of my adult life has somehow been involved in uh, scurrying up a political ladder. Did you, when you arrived in the Commons in 2015, did you think you'd be there forever? I didn't necessarily think I would get there in the first place. So um, thinking I'd be there forever was probably an indulgence too far. And indeed, whether the days of people being there, so-called forever, you know, 30, 40 plus years, I I'm not sure if, they if they've gone and we were going to generally have rather short shorter tenures. Um, if I was being cynical, which obviously I'm not, but if, no. someone, if someone were being cynical, yeah. they'd note that Hazel Grove had been a Lib Dem seat. Yes. You took it in 2015 yeah. during the collapse of the Lib Dems. Yeah. Your majority is only four and a bit thousand. Yeah. At a time when the Tories are yeah. polling very badly, oh, yeah, of course. you were going to lose your seat. You're just ru jumping before you well, were well, pushed. Well, no, no, no candidate in a marginal con seat should ever deny that that's part of their uh, possible justification for what they do. So I'm not going to pretend the fact the figures that are there speak for themselves. I think the question I had to ask myself in November um, 22, which seems a long time ago now, when I sort of announced the decision, was could I uh, flog, my, uh, flog myself uh, in order to uh, campaign and to do all the stuff necessary to, to hold a marginal seat? And I think, hand on heart, the answer to that at the time was no. And so the logical decision was therefore to make it known with plenty of time in advance of an election to allow another uh, candidate to assume the role and to, to step back in that way. But looking back over your career, there'll be various moments we'll come to when you've sort of broken through into national headlines. Mm. Um, you haven't become a minister. No, thank goodness. And you've been a bit of a troublemaker yes. from the back benches. Yeah. Why do you say thank goodness? Some people dream of climbing well, the ministerial pole. Because they do that, but all patronage is there today, gone tomorrow, taken away. Um, maybe I would say this, wouldn't I? But the idea of, you know, making something of myself being dependent on, on, on the whims of a, of a prime minister uh, seems quite unsatisfactory. Were you ever offered a job? Oh, very, you know, back in the day when, you know, we're all sort of uh, young frosters there and, you know, the, the, the temptation of being a, uh, a junior PPS, not even a senior bag carrier, is sort of dangled before you. That happened on a few occasions, but it just wasn't going to be for me. And if anything, you, you sort of went the other way. Yeah. You, you've, you've been a troublemaker on the back benches. Well, I think some people cause the trouble and some of us try and fix it. <laughs> well, let's look at some of those things then. Um, 
Uh, you you oppose Theresa May over her Brexit plans. You're one of the first Tories to openly call on Boris Johnson to quit. Mm. You then broke cover on the first to call for Liz Truss to go. Mm. It's just been a nightmare, haven't you, for all of your bosses? Yeah, but it all came it all came to pass in the end, didn't it? <laughs> so you were right at the end. Probably an early adopter. <laughs> <laughs> Let's rewind then to the the, to the the when you came in in 2015. Yes. Conservatives have just got a majority. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, David Cameron under pressure mm-hmm. to, to deliver the Brexit referendum. Yeah. Politics looks so different looks to how te- it looked back then. It was totally different. I think back to that sort of glorious weather that summer, and it's a dim and distant uh, memory of the um, tumult that was to come. You know, the, the amount of politics, I say, that's sort of been crammed into uh, less than a decade is extraordinary. He really has as if those events and the, that time has been truncated in such a, a short space of time. Um, Theresa May, obviously, within well, just over a year mm. uh, of you becoming an MP, becomes your leader. Yeah. What did you make of the when she announced that she was standing down and this sort of well, outpouring of public well, I, you know, enthusiasm? But actually, I, that's not how I remember her three years in government at all. No, I mean, is that, I, I, you know, I for one felt quite sentimental on Friday like, when, <laughs> when that was announced, and you wouldn't necessarily think that because she's somebody who has, I fair to say, grown on me over time. Um, and so I think that it is a shame, uh, but for totally understandable reasons, um, that she she's standing down from from the Commons. Uh, but no, I think you know, inevitably, when somebody's there at the heart of the fray in their tenure in office, perceptions of them at the time tend to be less kind uh, than they are with time elapsing. But has her reputation basically been enhanced by the people that followed her rather than a reappraisal of three years during which basically nothing happened? Well, it, politics is a numbers game, isn't it? And I think she was hamstrung as soon as uh, we lost our majority in that snap election in 2017. I think, sadly, uh, in hind- with hindsight, it seems that the uh, the outcome was rather inevitable given that arithmetic. Um, that's what it all went back to, I'm afraid, uh, and in, in her in her case. So Boris Johnson takes over, gets the majority in 2019. Yeah. And then almost everything he sort of touches seems to go wrong in various ways. Yeah. Your role in one of them, you uh, broke a three-line whip and defied the government over the Owen Patterson lobbying scams. There was going yeah. to be a vote over whether or not he should be suspended from the Commons. Yeah. Um, take us back to that moment. Well, I think that's actually where most of the problems began and certainly in terms of public reaction um, to to that vote I was one of 13 conservatives to vote in the uh, in the different lobby to the government um, and I think that people's sense of that rightly or wrongly was that it wasn't fair to change the rules and criteria part way through an investigation putting everything else to one side so in terms of process It was, I think, slightly irregular. Um, And and I had no, you know, I think that morning I was going to be one of those who was just going to find myself, you know, locked in a toilet somewhere or, you know, unable to to get there for the vote. But no, it it came in in the afternoon, a sort of clarity of thought that, no, I didn't think this was the right right way to proceed and therefore that I would rebel. And I think a lot of things that came after that in terms of the Johnson administration can be traced back to that moment, um, which I think was a moment of misjudgment by the government. And then, obviously, there were the allegations of party gates mm-hmm. and everything that followed from that and, and ultimately the, the report into Boris Johnson in misleading the government. Mm. Um, but there was also the, the, the Christopher Pincher and what mm. he knew about that. Mm. At one point, in the height of the sort of the Johnson drama, you accused whips of blackmailing MPs or, who wanted to oust Boris Johnson and even spoke to the police about it. Take us back to that. What was it, what was it you were concerned about? I think all of a sudden there was a, a great spike in... Uh, I coordinated calls from some in the press to, to colleagues about things that were deeply personal to them. And it seemed somewhat coincidental that this all uh, coincided with them either privately or publicly expressing no confidence in the Prime Minister. Now, if you read my remarks carefully, you'll note that I didn't necessarily direct it entirely at the Government Whip's office, uh, but also some perhaps the ominous greases who lurk behind the scenes of any Downing Street operation. Uh, I've never and never will um, say who those colleagues were out of respect for for their privacy. Uh, But it it, it struck me as a very shabby way to behave uh, in order to seek to prop up um, an administration uh, to uh, at least threaten or seem to uh, want to throw various people under the bus um, 
for that. I think there was also a question around um, uh, the uh, withholding of uh, funding for constituency projects. And I make the distinction there, by the way, I'm not talking about, oh, central office would, would withhold funds for campaigning activities. That's a misjudgment in my view, but it's a perfectly legitimate thing uh, to threaten. Uh, but when it came to questions of public money, uh, for the advantage of, of constituents, I thought that was uh, um, out of order. You talk about people's darkest secrets being dug up and leaked to the papers, the threats of withholding public money. Mm. I mean, you make this sound like something more like the godfather than, than the running of a government. Yeah, but less competent than the godfather, I suppose. Um, were you glad to see the back of Boris Johnson? Mixed emotions. I actually, on a personal level, he is an extremely likable person. And I know there's going to be you know, howls of, you know, laugh, laughter at, at me saying that. But he is very difficult to dislike. Uh, I just think it was so, so unfortunate, uh, the series of misjudgments, when he had such goodwill, not just from colleagues, but from, from the country as well. You know, I likened the 2019 election and the majority there, for those of us who went through the so-called Brexit years, to the sort of end of the Shawshank Redemption. And we just sort of, you know, uh, you know crawled our way through a, a you know, pipe of effluent and roll off on holiday to Mexico all of a sudden. And if it weren't for, I suppose, the dark clouds of, of COVID gathering on the horizon, who knows how... Uh, that the, the good the good that that administration would have been able to do i think it's it's absolutely uh, a great shame um that it ended in the way that it did obviously to be followed by uh, liz truss and then by um rishi sunak mm -hmm. when you arrived as a sort of bright and bushy tailed 27 year old in the commons yeah did you expect to be better led well um <laughs> Better led. Uh, I would probably expect it to be led more consistently by one individual in that space of time. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, those who put themselves forward for leadership positions have to have certain unique qualities. And I don't have those, so I'm not one to criticise because there's no way on earth that I could possibly do it. So that's, that's how I would caveat uh, this rather long answer to, to the question. <laughs> Um, but I would hope that those who do put themselves forward for leadership positions have enough sense of themselves to know what are their capabilities, what are their limitations, and whether it's the right thing for them. Uh, now, a whole other host of external factors, the mood of the party, the support that they have in the country, whether the economy is in a good position, whether you know, we're awash with a pandemic, all of those things uh, happen. Events happen, don't they? But I would, you know like to think that who would put themselves into positions of leadership and authority have that sense of themselves beforehand. It's a very polite way of putting it. Um, and what about what's happened since? I mean, we've seen sort of Boris Johnson and Liz Truss putting friends in the House of Lords and putting, uh, you know, giving out gongs. Have they brought the honour system into disrepute, do you think? I think some of the appointments have. Um, less so with Liz Truss, to be quite honest, because I actually thought, you know, this is an unpopular thing to say. I thought it was quite a, a small and concise list. I don't think it uh, raised any particular. Well, I suppose um, it wasn't necessarily the number. It wasn't the people on the list. It but, was the existence of the, the list. The existence of it. No, I, I, I accept that. But I, you know, in terms of controversy, I, I, I don't think there really was much mm. controversy to it. Um, and I think less so with the resignation on us of of, of uh, Mr. Johnson. I think some of the other appointments to the Lords have been um, questionable. Um, and uh, who who do you have in mind there? Oh, well, I'll say it without fear. I suppose Lord Lebedev. Yeah, uh, I would have um, questions uh, as, as to why he was appointed, and I've said so really in public evidence with with, um, with my committee, and also frankly Lord Crudders. I suppose that will unleash a, a howl of tweets against me from the noble lord, but but so be it. Yeah, as you mentioned, you are the uh, chair of the Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee, not the snappiest of uh, select committees. No, we're, we're sort of pack act instead. <laughs> it's much snappier. But with a broad uh, view of what is going on in public office, the Constitution. I wonder yeah. if you think what's happened. To, uh, do you think the standards in public life that we expect our politicians to live by are they higher or lower than when you arrived in the? I, th I think standards have, have increased over time. There's no doubt about it. And I think sometimes we have, you know, should be careful before we say that it's all going to hell in a handcart. Um, 
you know, I think on wider constitutional issues, our unique constitution has the advantage of being able to remedy uh, or, or correct itself as, as necessary. Uh, but I, I do think actually politicians are held to a very high standard um, on, 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 you know, a, a across the board, regardless of party, regardless of which walk of, of public life. Um, so I, I would be less, less critical um, than some might assume uh, in, in that respect. One of the recent innovations in our constitution has been the, the use of recall, yeah. uh, which means that if someone is suspended from the House of Commons for a certain length of more mm -hmm. than 10 days, it yeah. triggers this process and then the, the, the petition, yeah. um, mm. which would trigger a by-election. Yeah. Do you think that's working? Um, without drawing any particular uh, cases, because I wouldn't want to be drawn on that, I, I, I think it probably does require some level of review um, I think any any system does after a time. When it was introduced, um, I think by Zach Goldsmith's mm. amendment in the twenty towards the tail end of the twenty ten Parliament, um, you know that 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 that, that, that it, there's something to be said for for reviewing. I'm not saying change it and you know get rid of it. Far far from it. But I I I do um, wonder if necessarily thresholds. Um, not not to do with the recall petition, but the, the, the sort of days given out in in suspension are by you know that I'd want to have a proper review of it and look at it um, across the board because I, I don't think it's just fair that I say oh no it's all working mm. absolutely fine carry on uh, I'd want to have it reviewed because I think it is it is it was an innovation it is an innovation um, and I think it's only right after this period of time maybe it would be a matter for the next parliament perhaps for for this to take place but I think a review of it. Uh, would be useful because some of the uh, some of your colleagues we've spoken to they've said well the 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 10 days mm. you know threshold is very low and actually yeah. it means that the people who previously would have would have been suspended for a bit longer but then yeah. you've also got the 10 percent of yeah. electorate decided do you think they should both be higher i i wonder about the um the the, the, the days of suspension being higher uh rob but i then think there is a a further case for um, the uh, percentage. Um, I think there's only one incident whereby that that's not been mm. reached in in Northern Ireland, which has its own unique electoral. And it was the first time as well. Yes, to, indeed. To, since then, people um, got the hang of it. Yeah, and it, it. You know, I suspect. Unfortunately, I suspect the only way that this will ever be reviewed is um, when you know perish a thought, but some um, Labour MPs are subject to the process. It might focus minds. And then there's some cross policy consensus towards, uh, towards well, looking at it. Let's turn to some classic exit interview yeah. questions and some of your former bosses. Let's get your assessment of them. Sum uh -huh. up David Cameron in a word. Statesman. And why do you say that? He exudes that kind of uh, effortless authority. He has that, that bearing to him. Um, and I think he's maybe pleasantly surprising a number of colleagues of his current role as Foreign Secretary in, 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 in that respect. Do you think, given the, what happened, the manner of his leaving in 2016 yeah. after the referendum and then getting caught up in the Green Seal lobbying scandal and questions about who he was yeah. working for and so on, is he sort of repairing his reputation? He, he might be to some extent, yes, I think so. Uh, I, I was one of those... Um, colleagues who campaigned for, for leave at the referendum but had signed a letter, an open letter that was published at the close of poll on referendum day uh, asking that he stay on regardless of the result. Um, but I, I can totally appreciate why he made the decision that he did. Um, but in, in some respects, it was a shame. If, he, if we look back over everything that's happened since 2016, mm -hmm. Do you think the country would be in a better place if he had stayed on? I don't know. This is a wonderfully <laughs> journalistic, have practical question. Um, I, I really don't know. Who's to know? Yeah. OK, but he was then replaced by Theresa May. So Theresa mm. May in a word. She's earnest, isn't she? <laughs> that's a bit double-edged, isn't it? All words can be double-edged. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why I've chosen them. Um, a good prime minister suited to the job? I think she was a good prime minister, but not at the right time. Mm. I think, um, I think domestically. But again, it all comes down after that decision for an early general election to the fact we lost our majority, and you know, a prime minister's authority is is, is based upon their ability to command a, a lesser or greater majority in the mm. Commons. And if that's not there, you're always going to be in for trouble. Yeah. So she was replaced then in uh, in 2019 by Boris Johnson. Yeah. Boris Johnson, in a word, Faust. <laughs> 
Right, talk that out for us. What do you mean by that? Oh, I'm not quite sure who or which of us did, <laughs> did a deal, I suppose. I think he was the right right person at the right time, but I think there was consequences to, to him. Um, I think he, he possesses brilliant um, abilities, uh, but also has, has, has a number of failings, as, as anybody does. Um, but there was something about his brilliance that, that seemed slightly... Um, otherworldly. Uh, Liz Truss, in a word. Hurried. Hurried? Hurried. Too hurried. Too hurried, in both it was over in a hurry, and also um, too much was sought to be done uh, at once in, in not a particularly coherent way. So I'd, I'd say, and I, you know, I mean hurried. And, you know, things might have been different if, if, if um, things, everything wasn't sort of thrown in together uh, with a, such a sense of uh, hurried urgency. Um, if, if it had been somewhat calmer, um, things may well have worked out differently. Do you think it might be better if she hadn't gone around assuming that everyone was against her all the time? Yes, yeah, so that's, good, that's good for any of us, I think. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I can understand why, why in politics you sort of define yourself by who's against you sometimes, don't you? Um, it doesn't really hen- end happily. Um, because you then assume, as you say, everybody's against you, and then when you come to reach out for allies, there aren't many there. And then obviously she was then replaced a few weeks later by Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak, in a word. Charming. Charming. In a good way? Char- I th- in my experience, certainly, yeah. <laughs> um, has he just got a thankless task? Of course he, he has. T- he been, took been, over in 2022, yeah. after Boris Johnson, after yeah. Liz Truss, and all of that. He has got a thankless task, but he's also got what, the greatest honour that can bestow a citizen of this country. So just as I said at the beginning about not wanting to whinge about being an MP of a tiny violin section <laughs> screeching away in the corner, it's the same for anybody who puts himself forward to, to be leader of the party and by de- uh, con- consequence prime minister. Um, ultimately in this and all your interviews, you know, no one's compelled us to come into politics. We've done it off our own volition. And sympathy therefore uh, should be limited I'd like to see empathy of course mm. but, but really sympathy if you're asking for sympathy in politics you're not going to get it OK some exit interview questions then um, your proudest moments during your time as an MP I got a private members bill through my first year and the upshot of that uh, act was it allowed people in when they were appealing their, their sentences at the Court of Appeal to subpoena evidence from private sources uh, in their appeal case, which had been an oversight of the original legis- legislation. The upshot of that is, of it being an act, about four or five people each year since 2016 have been able to use the provisions of that legislation and prove their innocence and be released from prison. And that that's quite a thing, for, particularly someone who's never even been a minister, yeah. to know there's a piece of legislation which will go on being there mm. for much, much longer than you were mm. in Parliament. Yeah, it is. And I have no idea who these people are. I never sought to mm. find out who, who they might be. But I found having the opportunity of bringing forward that piece of uh, private members legislation mm. in my first year also was a, a wonderful crash course for understanding the legislative process yeah. uh, and how, how the place works. So that's your, your proudest moment then. What, what did you enjoy the least about the job? <laughs> um, it's a different type of pressure to any that I think you can experience. Uh, in in terms of, you know, we are all actors to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, And sometimes the projection, or quite often the projection that we give of being very strong, resolute characters is really held up with pretty rickety scaffolding. Um, So I think sometimes, you know, know, lots of us might be actually quite, you wouldn't imagine an MP being shy and retiring, but we may well have that deep in our characters but the need to project confidence at a time when you're not feeling at all confident is sometimes the most difficult thing. There have been lots of times when you've suddenly been the MP that every journalist in Westminster is phoning. Yeah, and I tend to ignore them. I'm sorry, Matt. Oh, I know that from personal experience. Yeah. But um, what's that like when you've, you've made a decision, you know, whether it's to call for promise mm. to go or you've, mm. you've raised a concern about something, and suddenly you're at the centre of a storm. Presumably, it's well, not just us phoning, it's colleagues, it's no, the it's whip. Every, it's every, you know, every, everybody phoning, you know, friends messaging you, my mum messaging me, <laughs> like, you know, everybody seeming to want to message me. 
And the only way I, I, I cope with that, so to speak, is by ignoring. It's not done out of re rudeness, it's done out of self-preservation and a sort of strange old-fashioned view that if I'm going to say something, I might say it in the Chamber of the House of Commons, which is uniquely one of those places MPs can speak mm. and might be better used for that, um, rather than sort of spinning plates with dozens of journalists who are all wonderful doing, doing their jobs. But ultimately, you're going to find yourself distracted from what it is you're trying to achieve at that time. Would you recommend being an MP to a friend or someone you cared about? Yes, but they should do it with their eyes open. But they should know that they'll have the best of times and the worst of times. And that they should know um, that there is often quite a lot of unfairness. Uh, there can be misrepresentation and so on and so forth. But you have to accept all that because what you're doing is of importance and is of public service. Um, uh, and you should do it with your eyes open, but most certainly yes. Um, the Conservative Party that you were elected to in 2015 looks very different now. Mm -hmm. Uh, you've got Lee Anderson going off and joining Reform UK. Others saying they want Boris Johnson to come back. Yeah, 20 yeah, points yeah. in the polls. Yeah. Is this an existential moment for the Conservative Party? Only if we let it be. We're sort of taken over by it. I've, I've used this before, and I, and I know Gerald Ratner hates it when his name gets taken in vain, but we have this sort of Gerald Ratner syndrome within the party. You know, he, he expressed surprise that his customers stopped buying his products when he labelled them as crap. Well, our voters, similarly, will be uh, disinclined to support us. If, if we all the time say that our own policy, what we're seeking to achieve is complete rubbish. And we've had far too much from internally, uh, colleagues talking down, finding problems with this, that and the other. Um, and ultimately, uh, it's the same kind of uh, reaction out there, which if we, are, we don't believe in ourselves and what it is we're trying to do, I'm afraid others won't. And so it's for us to project what it is we're about, what it is we wish to continue to achieve for the country. Uh, and that is the only way to avoid a so-called existential crisis. So finally then, in your exit interview, William Rag, what will you do next? <laughs> so I shouldn't have involuntarily laughed then. Other things is my answer to that question. Um, I've yet to resort to walking around with a sandwich board, um, but we'll see if we have an election in May or November to necessitate that. Which, which do you think it's going to be? It's not going to be May, is it? I don't know. I have no idea. It, it ebbs and flows depending who you read any particular day. But, you know, I want to do something that I find interesting. I want to do a variety of things because having been at Westminster for nine years or so, not entirely institutionalised and de-skilled, <laughs> um, I think there's going to be a need for uh, a variety. And I'm not entirely sure that immediately, at least, the nine to five will suit me. Would you ever come back, stand again, return to Parliament? Um I think you get very, very lucky to get one chance to do it. Um, and you'd have to, if opportunity and my inclination came together, then, then who knows, but it's not something I'm banking on. <laughs> very good. Uh, William Rag, thank you very much for joining us for your exit interview. Thank you, Matt.